Excellent, everyone. Um, first off, thank you uh, for joining us. I, I know you could be doing a lot of things with your time this evening, so we're happy that you joined us. Um, as everyone knows, the League of Women Voters is a political nonpartisan organization, um, and we encourage the public to be informed about uh, issues that affect our communities, but also to be able to advocate on behalf of the League as well as themselves. Um, so tonight, uh, we're happy to hear from uh, two representatives that will one, uh, really help us uh, figure out what's the most effective way to communicate with our elected re representatives, but also how to communicate with the greater community. And um, so with that, I'll introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Michelle Barr. She's the Associate Vice President of Advancement and External Affairs with the Jacksonville Symphony. In this role, she has responsibilities in the areas of development and fundraising, community engagement strategy, and government relations planning and advocacy. Michelle served for 10 years as a regional director for U.S. Senate Senator Bill Nelson, where she managed community relations and outreach, including holding some 300 mobile office hours, town halls, and roundtables in 10 counties in Northeast Florida, covering 6,000 square miles and including 50 municipalities and multiple military installations. She was also tapped as the deputy chief of staff for the, the city's first African-American mayor, Alvin Brown, where she was the office's nonprofit liaison and representative to board of the Culture, Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville and the Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens, filled role of liaison officer at, at the Emergency Operations Center during activations, served for a year as the administration's city council liaison and headed up special projects. She's a graduate of UNF's College of Education and several leadership programs. Michelle grew up here in Jacksonville working with nonprofits on issue and political campaigns at her family's film and video production company and has served as volunteer on numerous nonprofit boards, including current service as member of the Florida Times Union. I don't know about y'all, but I'm exhausted just hearing the things that Michelle has done. So Michelle, with that, I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much. And I actually rolled off of the community um, citizen editorial board in November, um, just about the same time that our next wonderful speaker, Mike Clark, retired. I can't believe he retired, but he's staying around and staying engaged, which is wonderful. I'm going to um, share my screen and hopefully um, that will work well. Um, I did try to put together a good PowerPoint presentation and hopefully um, everybody can see the right one. Okay. Is that up? Hope. Not yet, Michelle. Great. We're not, we're not seeing not it yet. Seeing, you're not seeing it yet. No. Okay. Let's try one more time uh, for me to get to share my screen. Um, share screen. Share screen. There How about it now? Here it comes. Perfect. Great. Okay. And hopefully I will be able to pull it up so that I can toggle uh, across the different, there we go. Okay. So uh, communicating with your elected officials. Um, as it said in my bio, I did spend um, 10 years as the regional director for US Senator Bill Nelson. And um, in that role, part of my job was to intake all the communication. Uh, people would call with um, and they would call, they would write, they would email all of these different things with questions, legislative opinions, because they needed help with something, any number of it. Um, I was there during the start of the Tea Party movement, um, having lots and lots of people um, coming to the office regularly, and we'll talk about some of that in a minute. Um, I did a little bit of research prior to this, and in 1995, the Congress, the U.S. Congress, was getting about 53 piece, thousand pieces. Uh, I'm sorry, 53 million pieces of mail that year. By 2011, that had dropped to 22 million. But added to that was over 300 million emails. So there was a huge shift um, in the amount of um, communication that was coming into the office and how that gets caught, sorted, addressed, and um, distributed is quite a feat. Hopefully the next slide. 
I just wanted to let you know, I, I recall seeing earlier a slide with that information and we're still on the first slide. Oh no, it didn't advance? It didn't oh, advance. Dear. Okay, well, let's try once more to see if we can get this to advance because uh, I definitely want you to be able to see it. How about that? Yep. Great, so there you go. So 1995, 53 million pieces of mail. Um, 2011 dropped down to 22 million, but replaced by 300 million emails. That was a huge number. I was, I was pretty stunned when I saw that. There are, when, and I'm going to talk for a minute, we're going to talk later about communicating locally, but for a minute, I want to focus on communicating with federal elected officials and with state elected officials, because it sort of operates the same way. You have really two choices, communicating with the local office or communicating with the Washington DC or Tallahassee office. And there are advantages and disadvantages of each. Um, the great thing about the local district office is it's a smaller office. So your communication is more likely to not only be noticed and recorded, but to get into the right hands. Um, it's also good because the, the district directors, which is what you would have in a, a house office or the regional directors, which you would have in your Senate offices. Um, it's really important that they understand what's, what's uh, critical and key in their own communities. So um, they are then able to turn around and share with the member when the member is going to be coming into town, what issues are top of mind. When I was working for Bill, I was getting a lot of calls from the Ocala area about the Horse Slaughter Prevention Act that had been provided. Anybody who's from Florida knows Ocala is a huge horse country. So when Bill came to Northeast Florida, it's a, an issue I was able to flag for him when he had a town hall meeting to be sure that he addressed that issue because it's something that was important. Um, your message also gets to the right person in DC faster. The advantage for calling DC, like, well, why would I call Washington instead of the local office would be if there's a vote on something that's eminent, like you found out the vote's happening that afternoon and you wanna get your call recorded. Um, there are, um, if you want your voice to be added to the chorus, the larger kind of chorus of things that are um, voices that are coming in. Um, and your, your message, if you call directly to DC, also can instantly become part of a tally if they're keeping it. There are kind of a couple of different ways. Most offices now, everything is electronic. So there are software programs. And when you call, they're going to ask for your zip code, not because trying to track you or anything like that, but because um, that's how they understand whether you're calling from Florida. And if you're from Florida, whether you're calling from Jacksonville or Miami or Tampa or where you're calling from. So they'll ask for the zip code. Um, some places still, if it's a hot issue, literally may have a piece of paper on the desk that they're just taking tick marks. Um, but those are kind of some of the advantages and disadvantages of calling local versus Washington. How do you find the local office? You go to the member's webpage and look. Um, you can search, usually it's under contact. It might be under, um, search, if you put in the search term, search district office or state office, that will come up. Um, you can see that Senator Rubio has offices in Orlando, Miami, Tampa, Jacksonville, Pensacola, Tallahassee, Fort Myers, Palm Beach, and Washington. So I just pulled up the Jacksonville office here. I happen to know they're in the federal courthouse. This is important. A lot of uh, federal officials are located in federal courthouses. What does that mean? It means you cannot bring in your cell phone. So um, know the rules. If you do make an appointment to go see or you decide to drop in and see your elected official, understand for the building that they're in, particularly if it's a secure federal building or a secured city building or state building, what the rules are, what you can bring or not bring so you don't have to walk all the way back to your car <laughs> and take it with you. Um, and then uh, Mr. Lawson has offices in Tallahassee and Jacksonville. Um, his office in Jacksonville is located in City Hall. Um, during COVID, too, a lot of offices are closed, so that's another important thing to check if you're going to go in person. Ways to communicate. This is the meat of what I wanted to talk about. Um, the advantages and, different, um, and disadvantages of all the different ways to communicate. Regular mail, U.S. Postal Service. People think this is the slowest, and it can be, but it's often the most impactful. Handwritten letters are rare. And when they do come in, they get attention because somebody took the time to sit down and write their thoughts and feelings. 
making the legislation personal to you, making it relevant, sharing a personal story is another really important thing because it demonstrates the impact of the pending legislation or the policy on the individual, on the constituent. Every time that you communicate with an elected official, you're giving them quivers in their arsenal that when they're going to the floor to lobby for something or against something, your comments, letters, calls, all of those things are really important tools that they are, are able to talk about on the floor and use as examples of what the real world impact is going to be of this particular legislation on people in their state. Phone calls, really great for immediate issues. If the vote is coming up, make a phone call. Absolutely. Call the local office. I always recommend that because everybody in the world, especially if it's a hot topic, is going to be calling DC. You're going to get busy line, busy line, busy line. Better to call your district office. It goes into the same computer system. You do not need to call all eight state offices. Please do not do that. Just call the one office closest to you and they will get your opinion entered by your zip code. If you want a response, tell the person and they can then elevate that from just a straight opinion entry to a response requested entry so that they can get back to you. It won't be that day, um, but they do try to get it set up to the appropriate staff at DC to get a response to you as quickly as possible. And please be nice to interns. You may well, particularly for this group, League of Women Voters, you're a very educated, savvy group. You may well know more about the topic at hand than the person answering the phone, particularly if they're a college student. Don't beat them up over it. Um, they are trying really hard to, they want a career in public service. They're learning how to do things. Answering the phone is the number one most intimidating thing. Interns have, I've had hundreds of interns over the years. The number one most intimidating thing for them is taking your phone call. Um, the staffers nor the intern are the elected official. We are but the messenger. So it's perfectly fine to be angry, to be irate, um, but being respectful and polite and understanding that that person answering your phone is not the member is, is important, but they want to take your message and take it accurately and correctly and get it to the right person. Email. Most emails, that when you go to the member's website, you click on the form, you're like, why can't I just get an email address? Why do I have to fill out this web form? Well, it's because when we put out the email address, People will just add you to their listserv. And as much as I love seeing pictures of your cat, I have a cat, what happens is people just add you to their group emails and you get everything, which overwhelms the system. So instead, there is a web form that you fill out. It helps assure that the um, communication coming in, it differentiates it if it's a constituent versus someone from another state. Doesn't mean that that voice doesn't count. It just means that we pay more attention to our constituents um, because those are the people that the member is elected to serve, right? Um, so it's best, again, if you have a local contact and a, particularly for League of Women Voters, you're so good at advocating for important things, get to know your local staffer in these offices. They will give you their email address and you can always email to them directly. Fax, fax is fine if you wanna use it in place of a letter. Um, not very effective if you are using one of those e-blast fax services, because what happens is it sends the exact same fax to all eight state offices plus the DC office. It completely dilutes the power of that communication tool. So rather than do, if you're going to do that and you want to send a fax, send the fax directly to one office. You don't need to do it eight times and you can ask for a response on that, and then it would be considered like a letter. Social media can be very effective. Make your case. Um, you know, if you if you are bullying, threatening, anything like that, um, it's not the, it's going to dilute the the weight of your argument. So um, I think, but that can be for many offices. They do pay great attention to it. I would say that varies office to office, though, about whether or not you would actually get a response through using social media. In-person visits, very effective, great to do with the local office. COVID is a little different as to how they're meeting with people. Um, but, and again, if you know the office building you're going to and what the rules are for going in, 
try to always make an appointment. The offices are very small and may only have one or two staffers who have to cover. I mean, I had, I had 6,000 square miles I covered for Bill. I was out of the office 60% of the time. We had a part-time staff assistant who later became full-time, and then I had interns, but depending on their class schedule, the office might not always be staffed. So it's always make an appointment um, so that you can make sure your time is not wasted and, and going, and then the person is not available because they're helping somebody else or they're at another meeting. Um, town hall meetings, really great. If you've got a state elected official, I know newly elected state representative Angie Nixon, um, does these meetings. Tracy Davis does these meetings. Um, really a great opportunity. Again, by making friends with your local staffers, you can ask them to make sure if there is a town hall meeting in your area that they let you know and they will add you to an email list and can communicate to you when there's going to be a meeting. Council, city council or public meetings. Really good opportunities, both for council and school boards who have open public meetings with public speaking opportunities uh, during that public comment to be able to come forward and make the comment. If it's a very large issue and you're going to have, you want to bring 500 people from your one organization, better than to have all 500 people want to speak, which can because they have to pass legislation if they're going to take a meeting past midnight. Um, better to have everyone have maybe select five people that are going to represent the group as a whole that will speak, have everyone stand up and tell the council members or the school board members, we have 500 people here tonight, all of whom want to speak, but out of respect for your time and our time, we have selected five people that will come forward on behalf of the entire group. In I like to add this, in exchange for us foregoing the right for all 500 people to speak, we would like all the council members to stay in the room while the five of us talk. Um, we would like your attention for the five. Um, because they get sidebars, they get pulled off, other constituents need to talk to them, that kind of thing. So it's okay to say, listen, we're, we want to work with you, but we would like your direct attention for the 15 minutes it's going to take the five of us to, to represent this entire group of 500. Petitions. Well, it depends. Um, if it is a petition that is full of people who have signed it with names like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, um, you know, it's hard with a petition if there's no information other than a scribbled signature to know whether it's legitimate or not legitimate. I think they get looked at, but if there's no way to verify the, um, the accuracy of them, there is no, you know, names or zip codes even or any kind of way, um, pretty much in a state office, all we can do is take those and say, we received um, there were 20 signatures per page. We got 15 pages, and we're, we'll send it up to DC. But um, but it's those are hard to verify what what they are and and whether they are um, they really reflect the opinion of the people whose names are on there. Protests, believe it or not, make an appointment. You can make an appointment to protest, and I know that sounds crazy, but it goes back to what I was saying earlier that um, um, offices are small. When the Tea Party movement first started, they um, would come. Um, they would they would try to make an appointment. It was a little bit strange the way that they did it. They would um, one of the very first meetings they did was they wanted to have all the elected officials come and address the crowd, um, and. They met with me and, and it wasn't a Republican or Democratic thing at all. It was just all elected officials. We explained to them and gave them the Senate and the House calendar and explained that the Senate and House were in session. So the members would be in Washington DC Monday through Thursdays that usually they did get out Thursday nights or Friday mornings. And so a weekend would be a better time to be able to do that to assure the member could attend. Um, instead, <clears throat> they booked it for like a Tuesday morning and then they put a bunch of empty chairs, excuse me, across the front of the stage with photographs of all the elected officials and said, we invited them and nobody showed up. And it's like, well, you knew that the House and Senate were in session and they're in DC. So it was, you know, um, but after that, um, when they would come to the office, 
it was great when I knew they were coming and I would have an idea of how many people because we were a tiny little office and it enabled me to book a larger room on the first floor of our building, <clears throat> excuse me, so that I could make sure that I had interns on hand, that I had enough staff to be able to intake everybody's um, forms, letters, whatever material they gave us, and that everybody was more comfortable rather than standing in this little tiny hallway. So that's that. Um, okay, local, moving now to local. Um, local city council and school board offices. Many of the same rules really do apply. Phone calls are really great on local because your um, opinion and your voice gets heard much more immediately and directly. Um, treat the ECA, which is the executive council assistant in Jacksonville, if you're calling in Duval County, um, treat them well. Again, they're not the elected official, um, but they are the person who can get your message most efficiently and directly to that council member. Odds are they are keeping a tally sheet, some kind of score sheet for people that call in on one topic or another. Um, and that can be, letters are again, very impactful. I highly recommend sharing your personal story and why the legislation, how it's gonna directly impact you. Um, most elected officials are in it for the absolute right reasons. They are there because they want to serve. So sharing how it impacts you is important. Remember in Duval County, you have a district council person as well as five at-large members. All six of those people are a vote and represent you. So you can contact all of them. Um, the mayor doesn't get a vote, but certainly a lot of legislation starts with the administration. So, um, and I've shared with you here, these are just some of the many offices that are available on the webpage um, that you can contact. Um, this is where you can pull up the list. There are, there's some great services the city of Jacksonville has where you can e one click email all the members. That's fine, absolutely do that. But again, it's great if you can reach out to your district person and say, I am your constituent. And this is what this, how this is gonna impact me. That's really powerful. And the names of the ECAs are on there too. Um, needing help with the federal government or any um, state government too. When you do need assistance with um, say a federal issue and for, because you are in the league, I know you're a thought leader and a lot of people come to you probably for advice on um, what to do when they need help. And <laughs> there is a form that you have to fill out because we need the information. What have you already done to try to resolve the case? What agency have you been working with? What are the core issues? And we have to have your written permission to contact any federal agency on your behalf. It's part of the Privacy Act of 1974. Um, there's, it's, it, it needs to be written out so there's no confusion about what's being requested. My, my do's and don'ts, and we are almost at the end. Um, do always include your contact information when you communicate in writing. I cannot tell you how many letters I've received that had no return address, no email, no phone number, and then I got a call from the constituent a month later going, no one ever got back to me. Well, that's hard to do if I don't know how to get in touch with you, so be sure you have your contact information there. Um, and be sure you're reaching out to your member. Um, you want to call and say, you know, you're my representative, and then I, I find out you're calling from Georgia. It's okay, I'll still take your call, but you should probably, and I'll help you connect with your reps in Southern Georgia versus um, Florida. Always be polite and respectful, even when you disagree, um, be nice. Um, don't expect a timely response to a rhetorical question. I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> rhetorical questions, do not expect a timely response. Um, if you really, you know, it's those are the questions where people say, doesn't it upset you that this has happened, don't, aren't you mad? Um, that leads to my other one too, I have on here, don't ask for the staffer or the intern's personal opinion, they cannot give it to you. Um, they are there to take your opinion, not give you theirs. Keep your calls short and to the point, it's not that we don't want to talk to you for 20 minutes, um, but for that you probably ought to have an appointment so try it, and if you need more than five minutes to really express yourself, then a letter or an email or a fax might be a better way for you to, to make that expression. Again, do make an appointment. Um, don't rely on a third party connector. If you get one of these calls that says push one to talk to your member right now, and it's a third party connector, 
don't assume the third party connector is going to convey what you're calling about. That happens a lot too. I pick up the phone and um, the, the person goes, I'm calling about the thing. And I'm like, okay, what thing? I don't know. The thing that people called me about that I'm supposed to tell you I support. I have no clue what you're talking about. So don't rely on that third party connector. Um, you don't have to have the bill number, but at least you should have an idea of what the topic is. Um, and most importantly, absolutely do make your voice heard. If you sit around and complain and never bother to pick up a phone, call, fax, write, anything. Um, I don't have to tell this group that, but please keep encouraging others who come to you and say, I'm so frustrated. Please make your voice heard. That's the only way that the elected officials know what's going on. I can remember Congressman Andrew Crenshaw talking about, I forget what the issue was now. They have been dredging. And he said his office had not received one phone call in opposition, not one. And I was stunned because of course I had received hundreds of calls. So I say um, it's really important that you always make your voice heard. There's my contact information. There's my LinkedIn. I do accidentally have two LinkedIn's, which is pretty frustrating. Um, um, and so it's both of those are me, but I only monitor this one. And um, there's my email address. Uh, you can at me on Twitter, but I may not get it. I'm not as good at following Twitter as I should. And there I am on Instagram. I do check my messages there as well. Uh, but I really appreciate the chance to talk today and I'm happy to answer questions. If you want to um, disconnect my PowerPoint presentation, then I think I can get back to the chat. Right. Thanks so much, Michelle. There's some great questions in the chat. Um, you wanna just take them from, from there? Yeah. Okay. Um, I cannot see them. Okay. So the first question is from Linda and it says, when we get alert messages and the email and phone numbers are included, do those phone numbers accept text messaging? Not usually. That's a really great question. Um, I, I do know some um, council members have cell phones. They're, they're, Text messaging became a bit controversial because under the Sunshine Law, all those communications have to be um, retained. Um, anything dealing with city business has to become part of public record, and that includes text messages. I know that under the Alvin Brown administration, the tech office actually set up a way that anytime a text message came into a phone, it automatically generated an email of that to um, so that it was preserved in the record. Um, we discourage people from communicating by text. If I got a call, for example, if somebody texted me on my personal phone about official government business, I would have to take a screenshot of it and email it to myself and gotcha. then get it recorded in the record that way. So it's just better to use email when you can, but that's a great question. Good. Um, okay, Linnell ask if you can say a little bit about the value in participating in the petitions that different organizations text, email, or share on social yeah. media. I'm interested in this one. My mom fills them all out and her email <laughs> box is so full she can't find anything. So a lot of, I think it depends on the organization. Some organizations use petitions as a way to get your contact information, right? Because they're trying to build a database of sympathetic supporters. Um, so again, I think if the petition is just scribbling your name and it's ambiguous, I don't think that's a very effective thing. If it is though a petition that is where you're putting down a, a piece of contact information, like, you know, you're signing something and then it asks for your email address. Yes, you're sharing that with the organization, but that is that also really does when they photocopy it and come to the member, it gives us a way to guess that's probably pretty legitimate. And I can always email you back. Best if you design a petition is for it to have at least the name, the zip code, and then an email address. That's really ideal. The zip code is, I think, one of the most important things because that is how I can't say the name of the software that the Senate uses because that's considered sensitive information. But I think every single office now just about is using one of these two software platforms and all of them track by zip code. Great, uh, I think we just have a couple more questions. Um, Susan asks you to clarify, did we understand correctly that postcards are more effective than emails? Well, direct mail, I mean, any kind of mail, postcard or a letter, a handwritten letter is the most impactful. 
I will tell you that it really is. And that is in survey after survey of congressional staffers that do intake, the, each congressional office has big mail rooms. Um, mail, that's the other thing I think I may have had in writing but didn't emphasize. If you're going to mail a letter, it really is best to send it to the local office. Mail that goes to Washington DC is delayed by sometimes up to three weeks because of the security processes that it has to go through before it's delivered to the office. There are security protocols that happen in the local office as well, but the volume is much less. So that's kind of the difference. The volume is smaller, so the local office is able to process those things quicker. Plus then when they get it locally, we scan it, we get it attached, it immediately goes up to the, per, the correct person and gets in the system faster. Um, but those letters, those handwritten cards, I mean, I even saved some of those. I had a weekly report that we did for Senator Nelson and we would send pictures sometimes of those. Um, so the more personal the story, the more impactful it is. Does it, do you accept handwritten letters or do you think they need to be typed? Absolutely, handwritten is the most impactful. Oh, great to know. It really is. And that is survey after survey of congressional staffers pay more attention to handwritten letters than anything else. And, then and oh my gosh, if it's a letter from a kid, oh, that one's totally getting uh, going okay. okay, maybe with a great picture. And then a couple of, I don't know, maybe rhetorical questions, and I think you addressed this, but might be a good way to wrap up. So a couple of people ask, you know, is there really any point in contacting politicians when they've made it clear they take a different view? I think there is. And I'll, I and again, I go back to that story I remember with Congressman Crenshaw, where he said his office had not received a single phone call. Um, and I think that you take away that argument by um, by calling and make your making your voice heard. Even even if you're calling to say, I completely disagree. I am a constituent of this person. I disagree with this opinion, and I want my my voice heard on this. I think that is important because it takes away that presumed uh, or perception of of. Um, mm, of unity or, or of there were no dissenting voices about this. I think that it's important to get it on the record. Thank you so much, Michelle. This has been really great and we appreciate it. Um, we're gonna put your presentation up on our website after this so everyone will have that great info. And now I'll turn it over to Linnell to introduce our next speaker. Thanks. Thank you. Michelle, um, thank you so much. And I just want to remind um, whoever is concerned about contacting or not contacting your local representative um, is Harry Burns, a young 22-year-old Republican. Uh, had he not changed his vote for the 19th Amendment, uh, the League of Women Voters uh, would not be in the business that we are in today. So we never give Great up um, trying to influence um, the outcome of a vote. So thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate you for that. Our next speaker is Mike Clark. Uh, Mike retired in December, 2020 after 49 years as a professional journalist, 46 of those which were spent here in Jacksonville as editorial page uh, editor of the Florida Times Union for 15 years. He and his staff won local, state, regional and national journalism awards. Before that, he spent 15 years as the reader advocate. Recently, the Northeast Florida Regional Council awarded him its highest honor, their leadership award for advocating for better quality of life. Beyond the awards, he is proud of building a reader interactive group of almost 4,000 people and enlisting almost 100 people as citizen members of the editorial board. Mike uh, has a wife, uh, Molly, excuse me, married 49 years and has two grown daughters uh, born and raised here in Jacksonville. And with that, Mike, I will turn the screen over to you. Thank, thank you, Linnell. Uh, and Michelle is one of our great citizen members of the editorial board. And I made a point of making sure we had equal representation of women on the edit, on the citizen members at the editorial board. Uh, by the end of it, we had almost perfect 50-50 representation of women. And uh, they did a great job, as well as Michelle. Uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, when I was a reader advocate, I was president of the Organization of News Ombudsmen, a national and international group, and I made a point that my successor would be a woman, the first woman uh, president of the Organization of News Ombudsmen. Uh, of the hires during my 15 years as editorial page editor, I made five hires, four women, 
and one African American male. So, um, and they, they, they all were great. They were great assets to the paper and to the readers. Now on to the subject. Um, consultants have spent a lot of time looking at journalism of the future and they've come up with the idea that the content will be split into threes. Original writing by the staffers at the newspaper, syndicate material and reader generated material. And guess what? Editorial pages have been doing that forever. And I'll, I must say in all humility that probably the letters are probably the first thing that readers turn to on the editorial page, forget about the awards. And so I spent a lot of time dealing with readers, trying to help them get their material in the paper, making sure that it also kept to our certain standards of tone and accuracy. So let's go over through the tips that'll help you get your letters included in the, in the newspaper. And although I'm not employed there any longer, these are sort of tips that would work for any media outlet. The first consideration is space. Uh, with just one page of opinion these days, we, we typically have a lead letter of about 450 words and then 450 words left for letters. So if we've got two letters of 225 words, there, there it goes, you've used all your space. And a lot of people would like to have the lead letter, but you understand there's only one per day. So there's some, you know, there's some competition for that space and not every letter deserves to be a lead letter. Uh, the second consideration is identity. We insist that readers use their names. It's important that the readers, the readers see who's writing it. Now, we, we allow you to use your first initial of your first name. So like uh, M. Clark, for instance. But if you've got a fairly unusual name, that's still going to allow people to track you down. Uh, some people are concerned that they might be subject to some sort of abuse if their letter is printed in the paper. I can only say that, you know, 15 years as reader advocate and 15 years as editorial page editor, 30 years, I'm not aware of anyone who was seriously abused because of a letter they wrote in the paper. They had a few people get some nasty phone calls, but really that's about it. Uh, and, and frankly, it's my job as an editor, if I thought a, a letter would subject someone to abuse, I'd try to, you know, eliminate the offensive material or the dangerous material or, you know, find a way to finesse around it. But I think that that's another consideration. I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, your letter being printed. Um, it, it ought to be original. If you're going to use material from some other source, make sure you reference it. Uh, uh, and especially, you know, when a group like the League of Women Voters is doing a campaign, everybody should not be writing the exact same letter. You know, you should be, you should be writing something in your own words. Uh, if, if we start, you know, if, if newspaper editors start receiving lots of identical letters, you know, we may not even use one of them because we really want this to be an original, you know, original piece from a reader and not something organized by a pressure organization. Uh, if your letter has an important source you think might be controversial, include a reference to that source so at least the editor can check on it. Uh, it drives me crazy, you know, if, if I run a letter and then readers say, oh, that person you know, that, that was inaccurate. Why didn't you know it, you know? Well, what that comes down to is these days is that very often there's only one person in the editorial page department anymore. And that one person's gonna tend to be overworked. And so we really don't have the time to, to do a whole lot of checking on letters. Uh, so, you know, it, it'll, it'll help the editor to know that you've, you've given us a source. Uh, lastly, be open to editing, um, especially I very, very often trim the length of a letter just so I can get three letters or four letters on a page rather than two. And um, 
you know, my job is not to change your meaning at all, but, but if you're open to editing, then it's going to, you know, it'll help your letter being used. Now, the reason you're going to see certain people in the paper more often is that they do all these things that I just mentioned. Very often they write frequently. Um, so, but, but if you have a letter that you, you, you really care that, be, that it's being run, feel free to, you know, send a follow-up email to the editorial page editor and say, are you planning to use the letter? Is there anything I need to do? Because any more, your letter is very likely was perfectly acceptable. It just got kind of lost in transit or just got, just got overwhelmed on a busy day. And, you know, if I know a reader really, really cares about a letter, I'll generally try to say yes to that reader. You know, I mean, we do publish every day of the year. So, so if, you know, we can generally find a way to get a letter in if it complies with all these standards that I just gave to you. Um, so also understand that this is a supply and demand um, issue. Uh, so some, some days everybody's writing about the same subject or even writing the same opinion on the same subject, which, you know, for variety's sake make, makes it difficult to get letters in the page. And if you're really, you know, upset about an issue and you really want your letter run, and I've already printed five similar letters in the last week, well, you know, you may not, your letter may not run. What we what we like is is someone with an original idea or an interesting idea or a constructive idea. Certainly, no profanity, no vulgarity. Uh, we try to maintain a civil tone on the page, uh, although allowing people you know to have strong opinions. Uh, there is a line that we would you know never cross. There are certain words we would never ever use, um, and. I'll give, give an exa another example. Um, people very often would use quotations that the, you know, like Abraham Lincoln said, so forth. And I swear to you over half the time, those quotations were phony, uh, that they weren't from the person they thought it was from. So I, I literally have to check on every, every famous quotation a reader sends to me in a letter because so often that they're, they're not real even though they're in the popular domain. Uh, people think Lincoln said all kinds of stuff that he never said, for instance. So those are some of the highlights on letters. Um, my, my rules for this is to be polite and persistent. So, you know, if I'm gonna call, following up on what Michelle said, if I'm gonna call an agency with a consumer issue, I'm gonna make sure I don't do it when I'm angry. You know, because that poor soul on the other line is probably not responsible. And, and, you know, and then if somebody knows me and then they know that I'm angry, you know, what kind of service do you think I'm going to get the next time I call? So um, be persistent. You know, if you really care about the letter, follow up and make sure it was received. And if there's a problem with it, what can you do to have it printed in the paper? So don't be shy. Uh, but do it professionally, do it in a business-like way, and you'll have more success than, than ever. And if you're happy with something you saw from an editor or something in the paper, uh, send a handwritten thank you note, and you will be forever appreciated. Because at the newspaper, we almost never get thank yous. Uh, and when we do, it really, it really makes a difference. A handwritten thank you note, even if it's on a postcard is, 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 you know, anytime I get a call from a reader and they, you know, they're saying, I'm calling about my letter in the paper and I'm thinking, oh no, this has got to be negative. But if they're actually calling with a compliment, you know, you're going to get doubly appreciated because people never do it. So those are some of the highlights on the letters. Sorry, I'm not the editorial page editor anymore, so uh, I can't speak for what's going to happen in the future. I know they're advertising for a replacement for that position, so there'll be somebody in that job, you know, in the in, in the reasonable future. Uh, but what I've told you today really applies for almost any newspaper. <laughs>
So that does it for me. I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you so much, Mike. I think that you were so thorough that you answered everyone's questions. <laughs> I'm not seeing any follow-up questions in the chat yet. Um, one did just come in. So can you talk to us a little bit about rebuttal letters, um, how you all think about those when, when letters come in rebutting another letter to the editor? Yeah, I feel I would feel a responsibility to, to run rebuttal letters, but the times I've gotten in the most trouble is when I run a rebuttal letter because I'm trying to be fair and there's a problem with a rebuttal letter. <laughs> gotcha. So, uh, and, and you know, there's a limit to how many rebuttals I'm going to get into. So, you know, we had one letter writer that was constantly right promoting the fair tax. And we had another guy that was constantly against it. So I knew if I ran the one letter on the fair tax, the rebuttal would come in. And that's fine, but I'm going to, I would kind of end it with those two because they would go back and forth forever if I let them. Right. They, uh, they need their own column. Yeah. But especially if there's, you know, if, if a letter, if you thought a letter was inaccurate or distorted, that kind of thing, uh, that's, that's what the letters page is all about. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we want to have those uh, civil discussions taking place, um, you know, uh, as far as the volume of letters, um, you know, we're still getting letters in the U.S. mail. We're still getting a few. So, uh, but the volume is up and down depending on whether there's a hot or not. So uh, here, here's a tip for you. If you really want to make sure your letter is going to be printed, send it in around a holiday because people stop writing around major holidays and we're scraping the bottom of the barrel for letters. That was the one great use for my email group because I knew that around, say, the Christmas Hanukkah holiday, I could fill up the letters page with stuff from my email group because without them, we would have trouble filling up the page. So if you've got a letter you're thinking about writing and it's near, say, you know, Memorial Day, hang on to it till Memorial Day weekend around that time, it'll probably get used. Great. We've got a couple more come in. Um, do you, did you receive more letters from Republicans or Democrats in terms of the issues? What'd you think? Uh, You know, I, I, I don't think, you know, I, um, I, I, I think it was fairly evenly split there. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was running a full page, I tried to make sure that I was, you know, tried to run um, an equal number. I think more men write letters than women. And uh, when Roger Brown was my assistant on the editorial page staff, Roger made a point of making sure there was a woman on every single letters page. So he was, he was a very conscious of that. Uh, but no, I think I've, we've got some real loyal letter writers from both sides of the ideological split. Uh, you know, President Trump caused all kinds of heartburn from me because I was always trying to, you know, fact check the latest conspiracy theories that people were writing in about. And, uh, <clears throat> the, you know, that takes a lot of time sure. uh, because you don't want a letter to be espousing something that turns out to be a hoax. And there, there are a lot of hoaxes going on these days that people actually believe. So sometimes I would, if a letter is very popular, an opinion is very popular, I might run it with an editor's note explaining what the real, the real issue is. So I've, I've done that on occasion. Okay. That segues nicely into the next question. How long does it typically take to verify and print a letter after submission? Well, it could be the next day or it could be you know, I'd say up to two weeks. If it's more than two weeks, it's probably gotten lost, gotten lost. Uh, 
but on the editorial page, we do a lot of stuff in advance. So for instance, here in the last few months, the Sunday, when I, when I was doing the Sunday reason section, it had to be produced on the previous Tuesday. Mm. So uh, now we no longer have a reason section. So I, I'm presuming the deadlines are a little better than that. But so it could very easily, you know, I could very easily have your letter planned and it's, it's been waiting in there for five, you know, five days, almost a week. So, you know, um, there again, if you, if you feel really strongly about a letter that it be Ron ask for a reply, uh, something that even when we had one person handling all the letters, we did not reply to every single letter writer. It's just too much. And then we'd have to try to explain, are we going to use it? Well, the, the fact is, we don't know whether we're going to use it, mm -hmm. you know, until we see what's happening every day. Uh, and then if um, most letters are fairly usable, I could guess I could say, you know, editors really don't want to say no, never. Um, but if you force them to, they will, um, you know, but most letters are fairly usable and it just depends on supply and demand, what the, what's going on that you know, that week. Um, so I got to say about the League of Women Voters, the statewide organization, I relied on them a lot for especially constitutional amendments. They do a fantastic job of giving the pros and the cons of each amendment and then giving their opinion. And they were extremely, extremely reliable. And uh, I campaigned for a long time to get rid of the write in loophole for elections. And that's still out there. I hope the league will continue to, you know, push for that. That's so. great to hear. We've got one last question, Mike. That's probably a good wrap up. Um, what do you personally think about, do you think that the letters to the editor serve to inform people or change the public's view on issues, especially around topics of race, discrimination, gender, and transgender issues in the public discussion? Well, you know, the, the letters, I think just by bringing up subjects that may not be even recognized by the actual professional staff members of the news media fulfill a very important public function. Showing that people's minds have been changed, that, that would require some sort of academic study or something, you know, um, and then proving that it came from letters, you know, how, how do you know that? They're, they're just, they're part of the public discussion, but I can say, uh, you know, through my writing, say on the editorial page, we wrote a lot about uh, African American history in Jacksonville in the, you know, the last 10 years. And we wrote about a lot of subjects that eventually got on the radar in Jacksonville, which is how we won a lot of these awards. I mean, we wrote about infant mortality. Mm -hmm. We wrote about mental illness and suicide. And then letters would follow that. And then I, you know, if I had, I had a, a, a parent in St. Augustine that had a son with schizophrenia, and had really severe issues about it. I gave him a platform on the letters page frequently, at least I, I kind of limited him to one letter a month so that, um, yes, yeah, so that that issue would be out there in the public. So I think, that serves, the letters serve sort of a traditional purpose of the news media. It's like I said to start with, that's the reader oriented content. And as M Michelle notes, the elected officials read those things. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're mentioning an elected official by name, oh, they will, they will definitely read it. Now, you know, if they're not happy about it or something, they might, they might complain to me, you know, and say, why did you run that, you know? Uh, some elected officials have thinner skin than others, but um, yeah, you know, and if, like I said, you know, don't send, don't send us all the same letter, the same letter, same content, but if you have a campaign, send us letters in your own words on a specific subject, say, for instance, protecting the waterfront downtown, mm -hmm. you know, um, right now that we've got all this open space and it needs to be, we've got a, 
generational historic opportunity to make sure that that riverfront is protected. Um, that's something that's worth, you know, writing about and writing letters about and showing that, you know, that, that you support that. Certainly we as an editorial page write about it, but if we write an editorial and no one responds to it, then sometimes you wonder whether, sometimes the time is just not right. right. I mean, I, I wrote about subject for years and then suddenly it became hot, which is okay because then I was prepared for it. But um, you can help make, you can help make a subject get noticed by writing letters. Thank you. Yeah, like I said, be persistent. If your letter isn't used, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with it. it. Most of the time, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just for whatever reason, it may have been missed, may not have just been, was in a stack and, you know, never got around to it. So, so uh, you know, I think, I think women especially maybe um, need, need to step up and, 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 and you know, be persistent about about things they care about because certainly you know an editor they just want good material that's all we just want interesting material on the page you know and we had we've had some great great letter writers female letter writers that i was glad you know i couldn't use all of their all of their letters because they were writing so often but uh, and some of them wrote kind of long so that was another issue um well, thank you, you know, Mike. Try not to write on more than one subject because that's going to make your letter too long right so then you'll write a second letter on the other subject that'll help that's a great tip i'm going to turn it over to linnell for announcements now but i also want to let you know mike there's multiple messages in the chat thanking you for the presentation and for your many years of service to our community well it was a mutual admiration society between me and the readers and um i, I appreciate you all so thank you. So Mike and Michelle, I, again, thank you so much um, for joining us this evening. Um, as everyone uh, probably knows, March 2nd, the legislative session begins. Um, so we hope um, that you will actually take some of what we've learned tonight um, and please uh, contact your elected officials. Um, a lot of bills moving around. Uh, They're gonna be coming up for a vote. It's very important that each and every one of us weigh in. Um, you should be receiving action alerts from League State. Uh, when you get those, please don't assume that someone else is calling or emailing or communicating with our elected reps. We need every single uh, League member who's in receipt of those action alerts to actually take action. I uh, will also uh, hoping that you will join us on March 3rd, um, Wednesday uh, at 1130. We are going to be uh, having uh, two guests join us, Elizabeth Anderson, who's the Duval County School Board Chair, as well as Hank Rogers, uh, the Citizen Oversight Committee member. They're actually going to talk to us about the half cent sales tax and let us know what's going on um, in, our, in our local community um, and, and how they're going to spend our money. And then lastly, uh, just a reminder, we do have lobby days coming up with State League. That's going to be April 7th, and it's going to be virtual this year. So no need to drive to Tallahassee, uh, worry about parking or getting to and from the Capitol or traffic. Uh, we're going to be able to do that online. So again, thank you to everyone who gave up part of your Wednesday evening and joined us. And thank you.